Hi everyone, and welcome to Kentucky Youth Climate Strikes Community Organizing 101 training. Tonight, we're going to be discussing the history of community organizing, specifically people of color-led movements, roles within organizing, and principles to carry within this work. We will also talk about the different styles of organizing and provide opportunities for you to plug in. Tonight will also be our final training in this series. So first to kick us off, we're gonna do some quick introductions. My name is Amy, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from Moorhead, Kentucky. My name is Isabel Valentin, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm from San Juan, Puerto Rico. Okay, before we go any further, I wanna first take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are currently on. Today and every day, we exist on land that has been stolen from its original inhabitants, indigenous people. In Kentucky, we are on the land of the East Cherokee and Shawnee peoples. We're watching as indigenous communities are disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, exacerbated by a lack of access to clean water and healthcare. And for those of us who are not indigenous, we need to show up by supporting the indigenous organizations and movements for change. Next, to make this space feel more personal, we want to do a quick welcome. We welcome everybody that's watching this, no matter where you are from, no matter what age you are, no matter what gender you are. We want to welcome all of you. I want to start today by going over the objectives of this training. These are the three main objectives that we want you to take away after finishing this training. So firstly, to be able to humbly approach this work with more understanding of what elements make up community or organizing. And second, have a greater awareness of the different types of community organizations and tactics. And lastly, leave this training with knowledge on how you can be involved in the future and next steps to plug into. For sure. So I'm gonna, to ground us, I'm gonna tell a personal narrative about what got me involved in organizing. I'm gonna make it pretty quick so that you don't get bored. But basically, after Hurricane Maria struck Puerto Rico, um, Puerto Rico was not receiving federal assistance and was not receiving assistance in general from the United States. Um, we are a territory of the United States. So this was particularly difficult as we cannot ask for help outside the United States and we exist, we depend on the United States currently for assistance because we are not an independent nation because the United States chose not to make us an independent nation. So all of these struggles um, of de decolonizing and colonialism and that interlock with struggles such as race and sexuality and gender um, all kind of imploded onto the Puerto Rican people. Um, in addition to struggles such as poverty, um, institutional poverty, struggles like food deserts and just an inability to get the resources that we needed. So in order to receive these resources and in order to redistribute the resources, I participated in a lot of community and local organizing because I, it's how I got involved with organizing because I really saw the people that I care about and the people that are important to me in need and the community organizing was just the only way to find a solution to these problems because the government, the government was not gonna solve it, them for us. Um, it's how most people get involved in community organizing, realizing the government's inefficiency in taking care of marginalized communities and in taking care of groups that are not white and cis and male. So I am, I just want to expand on the fact that community organizing is just it, you know? So when I say, what comes to mind when I say community organizing? Community organizing is not the same as activism. Often these two get looped in together when there are really different avenues of advocating for change. Activism can be identified as a political activity that sets up short-term actions and statements in a variety of causes and social problems. Activism is usually scattered and more unorganized politically, reactive, and unfocused. Activism is often more about the activist self-perception of righteousness rather than about confronting social problems collectively at their roots. Activism is not always bad, but it is not the most effective way to bring about change. Organizing, on the other hand, has clear long-term objectives aimed at winning gains for the, base of it, from, for the base from authorities or those with enough power to bring change. It involves some experienced organizers and the people whose material conditions are being affected by the issue. Organizing is strategic and since it is long-term, there's a self-correcting feedback loop in which participants can evaluate the actions that they've taken so far to achieve their goals and whether the efforts were worth it or whether or not they should be changed. 
Organizing includes campaigns, which are tactics that can gradually be escalated towards a constant objective meant to change the current balance of power. Think of Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights era. These events were no accident. They were organized, strategic, and they won. There is a longer arc to see any results, since the objectives are usually more concrete and there's a more meaningful than just voicing opposition. Organizers work beyond the public performance of unity. So some key elements of community organizing. Organizing is building power with people who don't have it, often because it's been systematically denied to them. Power, privilege, and oppression are all super important things to think about as you organize. Bringing people from the community together around a common problem, centering those who have been impacted by it, who is most impacted by this, and why are they, and are they being prioritized? Building relationships and knowing who your allies are. Um, this means people and organizations to have similar interests with you on many issues. Many times, um, these are organizers or people whose issues intersect with your issues. So sharing what resources, talents, and perspective people in the group have to offer. Um, we're going to get into roles at community organizing later. A common narrative or story for the group. What change do you want to see? Organizing then has two types of goals, external and internal goals. External goals are the public goals, the policy you want to change, the legislation you want passed, the revolution you want. <laughs> and internal goals are your organizational and base building objectives, how you build your organization and get more people involved. So, Community organizing is not new. There's a long legacy of it. Some of it, super well, some of it super well known and some of it not well known at all. Organizing locally in Kentucky has a strong history. And with the source of protests in the street, we felt that it's really important to share a little bit of this background. Okay, thank you, Isabel. And next, we're just gonna watch a quick little video about the history of community organizing. <laughs> We live in an age of protest. On campuses, in public squares, on streets and social media, protesters around the world are challenging the status quo. Protests can thrust issues onto the national or global agenda. It can force out tyrants. It can activate people who have long been on the sidelines of civic life. But while protest is often necessary, is it sufficient? Consider the Arab Spring. All across the Middle East, Citizen protesters were able to topple dictators. Afterwards, though, the vacuum was too often filled by the most militant and violent. Protests can generate lasting positive change when it's followed by an equally passionate effort to mobilize voters, to cast ballots, to understand government, and to make it more inclusive. So here are three core strategies for peacefully turning awareness into action and protest into durable political power. First, expand the frame of the possible. Second, choose a defining fight. And third, find an early win. Let's start with expanding the frame of the possible. How often have you heard in response to a policy idea, that's just never going to happen? When you hear someone say that, they're trying to define the boundaries of your civic imagination. The powerful citizen works to push those boundaries outward, to ask, what if? What if it were possible? What if enough forms of power, people power, ideas, money, social norms, were aligned to make it happen? Simply asking that question, and not taking as given all the givens of conventional politics, is the first step in converting protest to power. But this requires concreteness about what it would look like to have, say, a radically smaller national government, or, by contrast, a big single-payer healthcare system, a way to hold corporations accountable for their misdeeds, or, instead, a way to free them from onerous regulations. This brings us to the second strategy, choosing a defining fight. All politics is about contrasts. Few of us think about civic life in the abstract. We think about things in relief, compared to something else. Powerful citizens set the terms of that contrast. This doesn't mean being uncivil. It simply means thinking about a debate you want to have on your terms over an issue that captures the essence of the change you want. This is what the activists pushing for a $15 minimum wage in the US have done. 
they don't pretend that $15 by itself can fix inequality. But with this ambitious and contentious goal, which they achieved first in Seattle and then beyond, they have forced a bigger debate about economic justice and prosperity. They've expanded the frame of the possible strategy one and created a sharp emblematic contrast strategy two. The third key strategy then is to seek and achieve an early win. An early win, even if it's not as ambitious as the ultimate goal, creates momentum, which changes what people think is possible. The solidarity movement, which organized workers in Cold War Poland, emerged just this way. First with local shipyard strikes in 1980 that forced concessions. Then over the next decade, a nationwide effort that ultimately helped topple Poland's communist government. Getting early wins sets in motion a positive feedback loop, a contagion of belief and motivation. It requires pressuring policymakers, using the media to change narrative, making arguments in public, persuading skeptical neighbors one by one by one. None of this is as sexy as a protest, but this is the history of the U.S. civil rights movement of Indian independence, of Czech self-determination. Not the single sudden triumph, but the long, slow slog. You don't have to be anyone special to be part of this grind, to expand the frame of the possible, to pick a defining fight, or to secure an early win. You just have to be a participant and to live like a citizen. The spirit of protest is powerful. So is showing up after the protest you can be the co-creator of what comes next. Okay, I hope you took something away from that video. Next, we're gonna dive into the difference between national organizations and local ones. When people think of organizing, they often think of national organizations and national organizing specifically people that distribute their resources to help multiple communities. In fact, people usually tend to trust national and nonprofit organizations more than they trust local organizations. Why do you think this is? Take a few seconds to think about that. Well, the answer is people actually tend to distrust local communities and community organizing. People often distrust giving money to individuals instead of organizations because they feel like individuals are more likely to misuse those funds than an organization would. However, this is simply untrue. In Kentucky, key youth organizers have been very effective in collecting funds and distributing them for necessary medical supplies, food for meetings, food for meetings and even backpacks for protesters. Community organizing is routinely more effective than NGO and national organizing. Even more, local, organi local organizations have a greater reach to individuals than a national organization would. Now to give you some examples of successful community organizing, the historic protests against British law that led to the American Revolution in 1775, and then we have the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedoms, which is greatly credited to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and the Day Without Immigrants rallies of May 1st, 2006, which contributed to the defeat of the Draconian House Bill 4437, an immigration reform proposal which severely restricted the rights of all immigrants. Community organizing has been proven to work, and it continues to work. This is a practice that is committed to bottom-up efforts, or more frequently known as grassroots movements. Next, youth-led movements are very important in community organizing due to the belief that the youth are the future of the world. There are even youth today already spearheading global change. And this is not to be confused with the idea of youth exceptionalism, which is the belief that all youth deserve to be centered just because they are young. Instead, centering marginalized young voices has sparked community-led change across the world. A popular example can be Malala Yousafzai, a teenage community organizer that suffered a bullet to the head for trying to give women access to education. She organized her community in order to make education accessible, and she was successful. 
Another example of community organizing can be seen in Puerto Rico when the community organized itself to remove disgraced Governor Ricardo Roseo from his position. Through community and youth-led protests and riots that lasted weeks, he was eventually removed from his position. Community, community youth-led protests, mutual aid funds, riots, and etc., have historically pushed change upon the world, and we will not be the exception. And now to Isabel. For sure. And when thinking about getting involved in community organizing, there are some principles and attitudes that one needs to carry. You should ask yourself the following question. Who should step up slash step back in this moment? Am I someone who should step back? If you're a new organizer, also known as an untrained organizer, you must consider who you should be looking to for direction and where you can best support. Strive to work with the community in a way that respects existing knowledge. It's super important to be a resource without trying to direct the activity of the community or assume that you have complete understanding of the issues at play. This means you should try to humbly approach a community and create open dialogue about resources and intentions. Be open to the idea that the wants you carry may be different than the organizers, than the organizers goals or needs. Continuing this value of humbleness, be willing to adopt community-generated models of organizing and covening. Have an attitude of learning. You're not going to learn anything by walking into a place and expecting to be a leader in the group right away. Plus, no one likes it when someone acts like a jerk. Some more things to keep in mind are that you need to be respectful of the norms of the organization or space you're entering. Follow the 75-25 rule. Listen at least 75% of the time, probably more. You can learn a lot more by listening and you and that can help you frame the skills that you have to and offer in them in a way that will be most appealing and approachable to the community and build relationships slash focus on mutual interest. Don't see people as the means to an end or as resources. Build human connections. Where are, what are all, what are all of our roles? Think about what speech you are good at and enjoy and Focus on the many ways to get involved. If you like being on the front lines, then you can be in protests, sit-ins, or marches. Are you artistic or creative? You can design infographics and flyers, create art and music, and share it. Do you act from your home, but you can act from your home by using social media, your social network to spread educational information and ways for others to organize as well. You can support other, others and make care packages to deliver to your communities and frontline organizers. And now for the different forms of organizing. There are various forms of organizing depending on the purpose of the organization or movement. Though some movements may have the same goals, there are many different strategies to get there. For example, when looking at civil rights movements, some prefer to go the peaceful route, while others choose to not solely rely on nonviolent tactics. In addition to the different forms of organizing, there are also different levels of organizing that you can become involved in, in an organization or in a movement. Local involvement. So local involvement relates to being involved in your nearby location. This can be in the form of a local organization, local chapter of a larger organization, city council, or even within your school on the school board. And next, state involvement. State involvement is similar to local, but it is expanded to include movements occurring at the state level. Just as there can be local chapters for a state organization, there can also be state chapters for a national organization. Next, national involvement. National involvement occurs at the level in which anybody across the country can, can participate. National organizations may be headquartered in one location or in multiple. And then lastly, international involvement. International involvement includes participants from any country or nation across the world. Lastly, we want to emphasize the importance of, de of valuing the development and supporting campaigns that are driven by a local voice. Organizing is not about being glamorous. This attitude, also known as cloudivism, is the idea of joining a popular organization solely for the purpose of showing it off to others. This is when you try to be involved in community organizing because it is cool or will bring you intention. Organize because you are passionate to create change, not because you want to show off. And now I'll pass it off to Isabel. Definitely. And across the country, we've seen mass youth uprising and locally our across our country has been difficult to identify who is leading what and how we can best support. Now we have already touched on principles to hold when entering into an organization and maybe you have a certain talent that you're eager to share to advocate for change but you aren't sure where to start. We don't have an exact checklist for everyone to follow but we can offer some tips. Research which orgs and people are in your area doing work that is positive and effective. To kickstart to think this, think about what issues you are most passionate about. 
maybe this is climate justice, workers' rights, or maybe a lead from a skill you would like to share, like the roles we listed earlier. Don't limit yourself to organizations. Some of the best work happens by individuals simply working together. Most organizations are looking for folks to join that will make this most organizations are looking for folks to join will make this accessible. For example, Kentucky Climate Strike has weekly or bi-weekly onboarding calls. Currently, we are seeing organizations working together in coalition during this time, and it is so important to remember the work we are doing must remain intersectional and highlight anti-oppression in frontline communities. For example, Kentucky Climate Strike is a climate justice movement committed to centering Black, Indigenous, people of color, but also recognizes that there is no possibility of for a just transition to clean energy and green jobs without racial justice. We're not going to list organizations to, for you to work with, especially since not everyone is based in the same location. What we will say is that we're going to encourage you to get involved in your local intersectional orgs and racial justice organizations. We do want to name an emphasis on checking out mainstream organizations that you're considering organizing since there might be red flags or past incidents that may reveal this organization is not the best to support. This is all to say that all movements are imperfect, but some are more intentional than others. You can Google, you can use Facebook, check in with friends that you know are involved, or even DM or Instagram. Finding the organization that is right for you. You look into what platform of various organizations and what values they are committed to. You don't, but you don't become involved for the sake of becoming involved. You organize with the group whose mission you believe in and whose vision you want to be a part of, you want to see yourself represented in. Maybe you don't have the capacity to be inside an org right now, but you can still reach out and see if you can join their forms of communication, be it Slack or Discord, so you can be in the loop when there are needs, campaigns, and call to actions. Invite your friends along as well. While this work can be tough, we owe it to ourselves and our communities to make changing the world a joyful process. You get to decide what your involvement looks like from here on. No matter how much you decide to do it to do, it is important to continue taking care of yourself and being open to feedback. In our follow-up email, we're gonna include links to a post about coping with burnouts and resources for self-education. Okay, thank you everyone so much for watching this and learning with us. We are so pumped to bring in new folks into the movement and to learn from experienced organizers who are also present in this movement. Uh, now we just want to take a moment to um, shout out some of the other trainings that we have. As you can see on this page, we have white privilege, anti-oppression for white and non-black POC allies, COVID-19, climate crisis and racial justice, non-black POC healing space, and United Black Youth. Um, there, there are also recordings of, the, of these trainings that you can also find on our page. So coming out of this training, we're also going to have what we call learning circles um, based on the identity that we hold. These are spaces uh, on a WhatsApp group that um, provide further discussion, questions, support, resource sharing, and continue learning. And that's a, that's a space for you to ask any questions to anybody else who is also um, involved in community organizing within their own community. And uh, that's a place for you to ask them questions and to be a resource for them as well. So uh, some of the other resources, as you see on this page, is a big, a big list that we have that we'll be sending out um, via email. So on this list, we'll have a lot of different resources for racial justice learning specifically. That includes books, movies, podcasts, um, and other resources you can go to to learn more about the BLM movement and other racial justice learning um, sources. And then lastly, uh, well, there's this recording that you're watching right now. And lastly, we have our social media um, plug right there. Our Instagram is at Climate Strike KY, and so is our Twitter. Feel free to go follow those accounts to learn more about um, our organization and what we're doing at any given moment. And thank you so much. Thank you for joining, and we hope you have a great night. Thank you guys so much.